I reckon about 10 minutes. Is that, does that work for you? If I meet you out at the ponds? All good. It'll be good to see you, Mel. Okay, we'll see you in about 10. How you been going? Uh, battling on. We are once again back in Gore meeting Paul Jones. It's now four years since his son Lockie was found dead, presumed drowned in these oxidation ponds. I am worn down, it's been a lot of stress and anxiety and fighting and... So tell me what your reaction is to the expert pathologist's findings. Uh, it was more like I told you so. In the latest twist in the Lockie Jones case, an expert UK forensic pathologist has thrown doubt on the original findings that he died by drowning. We've now got the proof that there's no proof that my son drowned, so what happened to my son? I don't believe he's walked out there. The official story has always been that Lockie ran away from home about 9pm, climbed a gate or fence and went about 1.2 kilometres over a rough track to the end of the ponds, fell in and drowned. If it all played out and it was the truth, I could believe it, but I don't believe it at all. And now Paul Jones has more to back up his claim that Lockie didn't accidentally drown, but died some other way, or was possibly murdered. Should be a lot smaller in here. You'd see his Late last year, newsroom engaged forensic scientist Dr Anna Sanderford to review the original post-mortem findings from 2019, which concluded death by drowning. She sent images of tissue sample slides and relevant documentation to a UK forensic pathologist, Dr Alexander Kola, who specialises in investigating suspicious deaths. Essentially Dr Kola is saying that there isn't enough information from the post-mortem um, that was done originally to support the diagnosis of drowning that's been provided. So this is the original autopsy report done by a local pathologist in Southland in January 2019. It says cause of death was drowning. But the UK Forensic Pathologist Review found it is not safe to provide drowning as a cause of death. So he's saying that there's, there's not the medical pathological evidence to support a diagnosis of drowning. Yes, and the main reason for that is because the original post-mortem was not conducted by a forensic pathologist. Can you just explain the difference between a general pathologist, do you call it a general pathologist, and a forensic so, pathologist? For ease, in this I talk about non-forensic pathologist and a forensic pathologist. So in this circumstance, a non-forensic pathologist was instructed. So that person may not necessarily be fully trained to do a forensic post-mortem. That decision was made for some reason, and therefore a kind of standard post-mortem was conducted, which is not as thorough. Because you're not qualified. Either you're not like qualified to the level of a forensic pathologist. Or you're not trained potentially to do it. The frustrating thing is the police had um, they had the option to use a forensic pathologist. And they didn't. And we need Paul's to longtime we friend and support, Karen Maguire. Because that night they'd already determined that Lockie had drowned. The box was ticked for the coroner, no suspicious circumstances. And so that's why it's gone to a general pathologist. I know my son didn't walk out there, I was dead, and I know what he was capable of and not running out of a house at nine o'clock at night and jumping over some fence and jumped in a bloody pond was not what he was capable of. He used to go to the swimming pool and sit on the edge because he knew he wasn't allowed in the water until someone was with him, so why would he suddenly change his mentality?
Newsroom published its first investigation into Lockie's death two and a half years ago. By then, the police had closed the case. Death by drowning. No suspicious circumstances. The town of Gore, population 8,000, services some of Southland's best farm and country. It's two and a half hours south of Dunedin, or 45 minutes north of Invercargill. Lockie was found floating face up at the far end of Gore's oxidation ponds. They were designed in the 70s to cope with an expected population explosion that simply never came. Just in close to the uh, bank here, he was found. And you were here that night? Uh, no, I actually didn't see where he was found, but uh, they put a stick out here where he w was located. From where he lived with his mum and half-brother to where his body was found is approximately 1.2 k's. We walked it a number of times and it took us between 18 and 20 minutes. Lockie though was three and a half, had bare feet and a full nappy. He would have had to climb a cyclone gate with barbed wire or a wooden fence, walk down a rough gravel road, up an embankment and go all the way down here. And back then it wasn't mowed like it is now, it was long grass, thistles and nettles. Yet strangely, Lockie had no marks or even scratches on his bare feet. I close my eyes at night and I still see him and that, but um, I'm positive, 100% I know my son and my heart and the way I brought him up and treated him and that, there's no way he would have walked out here on his own. These photographs from the police file show what the area looked like when Lockie's body was found. It was about one hour 40 minutes after he was reported missing. They uh, went to the funeral home, the funeral director, and um, we were seen his body and then I got him and his assistant to check. So they took all his stuff off him and checked it and there's no marks and the pathology report says there's no marks on him as well. At the time, in January 2019, before the area was heavily fenced, you could access the place by driving down the side of the river, on the east side of the ponds, and through the middle strip, seen here at the top of the screen. So when you went the next day to the ponds, had that area been cordoned off by the police? No, not that I'm aware of, no. It was during the filming of our first story in 2020 at the Gore Showgrounds, a place where Paul used to bring Lockie for outings, we'd discover that the police had not done a full scene examination following his son's death. When someone dies, like even in a traffic accident, the whole area is cordoned off. Yep. They fingerprint, yep. they look at tyre tracks, they look yep. at footprints. No, I just think that they um, straight away suggested that it was an accident. So they didn't do what they would have done if they considered it anything other than an accident? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Somebody made a decision seemingly very early on in the process to not request a full post-mortem. And so that's when we sort of start talking about unconscious bias. The police made a decision very early on that this was an accidental drowning. Yes. On what, the face of it? On the face of it. So if you've already told somebody, like a pathologist, that it's a drowning case and it's not suspicious, then the post-mortem will be done on the basis that, in theory, we already know what the outcome is because this child drowned. From the minute they found him, they put it down to drowning. Nothing else. And they haven't even explored any other options ever. And once that's out in the public, it's like a tunnel vision. Well, the, the expert said he drowned. What do you understand should have been done in terms of the autopsy? Oh, there should, there'll be a procedure that forensic um, pathologists follow, and it'll be pretty in-depth. So there'll be things like x-rays, CT scans, um, water samples taken from lungs, samples taken from the stomach, you know, all analysed. None of that was done in the initial autopsy. So there's a big difference, isn't there, between a routine autopsy 
in a forensic autopsy. Absolutely. How do you see those comparisons? It would be like going to a mechanic to get your tooth out. You've got to go to the right person for the right job. And Lockie wasn't taken to the right person. No. And this was done by a person that's never done a child. He wasn't qualified to do it. So back to that original 2019 autopsy report. One of the statements was that the lungs were unremarkable. As we understand it, if he had drowned, there should be some abnormalities to the lungs. It was what convinced us to get an outside expert opinion and led us to forensic pathologist Dr Kolar. Because he's in the UK, he's one step removed from here, so he has no skin in the game. And overall, he considers there's not enough information to, to make a, a decision on the cause of death as being drowning. Because what we're dealing with is a father who's been agitating for a long time saying, I don't believe my son drowned, I don't believe my son drowned. And in this point in his report, he's sort of making comment that there could be other causes of death, maybe. Yes, he says it's impossible using the pathology to exclude somebody else having been involved in the death. But you would need to do other forensic and investigation approaches and techniques to be able to guide that investigation. And so again, I come back to the same point that had we done more work at the very beginning, more work had been done at the investigative stage, we'd have more foundation, we'd have a bigger foundation and more information, and more information about what our final jigsaw puzzle looks like. One of the key elements in the UK pathology report is about lung weight. Referring to drownings, the pathologist says due to the waterlogging, the weights of the lungs are generally significantly elevated. The report explains that the mean weight of a three-year-old boy's lungs is roughly 300 grams. Three-and-a-half-year-old Lockie's lungs weighed just 245 grams, so under the average which meant there was no evidence of waterlogging because his lung weight was not elevated. Due to waterlogging, you would expect the lungs to be heavy. Well, that's on the assumption that all lungs in drowning cases are waterlogged and are therefore heavier. Uh, what he's actually saying here is that the, the lungs are not heavy, and in fact they're slightly light for a child of his age. We thought we'd bring you a pen drive. As it turns out, the UK forensic pathologist isn't the only expert saying the drowning diagnosis is unsafe. So this has got the um, info about the forensic... The recording, done with permission, is of a meeting Karen and Paul had with Detective Inspector Stu Harvey. So let's listen to what he's said to you, so we've got that here. Um, Later, we'll hear the stage. Is that the first more than the parents? In some way, a, a local supporter. Mm -hmm. What we discovered is that the police, during its reinvestigation of the case, had also engaged a forensic pathologist to review the original findings death by drowning. The post was reviewed by a forensic pathologist from Christ's experience, multiple person. But perhaps just as extraordinary is the revelation that the original pathologist felt pushed into doing the post mortem he was hesitant to perform. I thought to him and he said I don't want to do that post mortem, I did not want to do it. I don't do children, I don't didn't want to do it. Um uh, so the police know that a diagnosis of drowning could not and should not have been made, but it seems to have had little effect on the outcome of its reinvestigation. I don't think the um, second investigation's any better than the first. I've got no answers and uh, 
no answers at all. But you don't know the outcome or you do know the outcome? Uh, well, I don't think much change that we've been uh, told. Yeah, we've been. What have you been told? That no one can be held... Accountable. Accountable or culpable for negligence. And they don't know what happened? No. No, and, and they've admitted that at that meeting. Nobody knows so how we got out there. He said it's up to the coroner to make a decision and not the police now, hasn't he, Karen? That's what he, he said. He said it's the, the, the coroner's job, not, not his. So he's done the reinvestigation and it's back with the coroner. Mm -hmm. Paul and Karen believe Lockie was carried or possibly driven. The ponds were accessible by vehicle back then. They think he had been dead for some time before being placed in the water. We don't know how long he was dead for. That's another red flag I've got. His body was stone cold. I don't think he went missing anywhere near the time that they've suggested he was missing. The timelines are all not right. His body was cold. No marks on his feet or body. A dog never picked up a scent. The police until, dog? Yeah, until 40 metres out. That would indicate he was either carried out there or driven out there. There's nothing, nothing that they've ever given me to say he walked out there. And if he'd fallen into that water, it's on such a gradient that, um, you know, hands out first, because that's what little kids do to protect themselves. There's not a mark on his body. It's perfect. None of, it added, none of it adds up, still doesn't add up. What about the depth of the pond? He would have been able to stand up. Yep, easily. If he'd fallen in, he would have been able to stand up. So it was really shallow. Yep. yep. A major part of the police case that Lockie's death was an accident was an eyewitness account that put Lockie at the corner leading to the ponds the night he went missing. <laughs> Well, they got it completely wrong, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they have, because she, she described a young child fitting Lockie's description. This is the witness who was on the corner who says she saw Lockie. Yep, key witness. The police uh, are basing well, everything on this key witness. Yep, they are. This is how they come to their con conclusion. conclusion. Yeah. So, so she there. described a young boy fitting Lock Lockie's description, but then she described where he lived and what colour car was up the drive of where he lived, and it turns out that's not where Lockie lives. It's not even in the same block. It's a case of mistaken identity. So in your opinion? Yeah, in my opinion, it's a case of mistaken identity. We thank you for the days of life, which he had. Lockie was laid to rest at the Gore Cemetery, along with his favorite toys and the police hat he loved wearing. Stories will be told, you will be remembered. For Paul and Karen though, there will be no peace until his death is fully explained. There's always that option of Lockie telling his story. What does that mean? It means Lockie might still hold the key yet. He might still be holding on to that forensic evidence. What are you saying? That maybe Lockie needs to be exhumed and it's his turn to tell his story. Would you go that far? Well, we've talked about it. Yeah. We're not going to stop. We're from South Lamel. We're fought on the front line. We're not, we're not mucking around anymore. We're bringing the big guns to the fight. No more knives. Mm. It's Lockie's time now. The police have had their chance. They've let Lockie down. He's a three-year-old wee, wee boy. They've let my son down. But not anymore. Do you think there's a few people in this town that should be a bit afraid? That the truth's going to come out. Definitely. And the truth's coming out, so... It's only a matter of time now. <laughs>